All right, good morning. Um, thank you for making it out this morning. It's always fun to have the, the first presentation of the, uh, after the first day of the conference to see how many people actually survived the first night. So I'm glad to see uh, a good number of people here. So yeah, I'm PJ Waskevich. Um, I'm a principal engineer in the platform group of uh, Solid Fires division within NetApp. And today, um, I wanted to come in and share some of our experiences with uh, using network namespaces um, in a way that we found wasn't uh, very typical, at least from what we could find, uh, to solve some problems within um, our storage appliance. And some of the challenges we came across, uh, how we worked around some of those, um, some techniques for scaling, and some areas that we found uh, might be good areas to focus on uh, within the community to try and improve uh, the API and some of the plumbing that's exposed by uh, the network namespaces, um, but we'll get to that. Uh, and if uh, anyone has questions, please feel free to ask. Um, just please raise your hand so that we don't have the whole room shouting microphone um, as you're speaking so we can get a mic to you. All right, so the obligatory agenda slide. Um, so I'm going to cover why, why did we get to using uh, network namespaces? Um, now, for the sake of time, I cut down some of that, um, but in the paper, uh, there are uh, some examples of some things that we tried, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of allude to them, but uh, I won't go into you know, great detail, um, but I have some fancy pictures in the, in the paper as to what, um, what got us to where we're at today. Um, so what is our application, what was the need for our application to use this, and then what did we end up um, coming up with. Um, and just in case people don't know how to programmatically use uh, network namespaces, uh, you might use them on the command line or you might use them within another framework such as LXC or Docker. Um, I'd like to kind of level set on um, how would you actually do some lifecycle management of a network namespace. So how do you create it? How do you name it? How do you refer to it uh, within an application? How do you switch to it? Um, and from there, how do you start doing things more efficiently when you're dealing with very large numbers of namespaces? Um, and there are some techniques that we, we came up with that we'll share on this presentation um, with some data that's not in the presentation, but I can, I can go ahead and quote it. It's, it's very uh, loose data that uh, I'm not allowed to publish, but I can speak about it. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and for our uh, for application, we are uh, more of, a, of an appliance. So we, we get the, uh, the bane of the existence of getting to run on uh, what I'll call an ancient crusty kernel. Um, we're still running on a 3.8 kernel, so we ran into some problems with um, some network namespace plumbing in the kernel uh, that was fixed later, and I wanted to call that out to show just how much of a, a massive impact the performance was. Um, and that'll kind of shift some of the discussion into some pro proposed improvements so that we can try and prevent uh, changes in that space from causing scalability problems again in the future. Okay. So why did we want to use network namespaces? So we have cloud infrastructures such as uh, Azure and AWS, um, some private cloud, public cloud services all over the world that uh, can let you take your application and shove it into a container or a virtual machine, uh, and that's great. So if you have a little compute node or you have a web server or a database server and you need to do some kind of containerization and get it out of a traditional data center, this is something that you can easily do uh, in a lot of these frameworks today. Um, but there are some applications that will need to run inside of a public cloud instance or a private cloud instance um, that maybe isn't an AWS thing, maybe it's a storage appliance, or maybe it is um, some other database appliance that's like a distributed database server, um, where the application itself also needs to be aware of how to operate in the cloud, meaning that it has to serve um, multiple tenants or multiple users so that you have some core logic of the application uh, that manages some kind of business logic that's managing the, the tenancy but then at the networking layer, that's where you need to actually enforce some of the containerization, uh, if that's even a word, um, but you need to enforce some of that uh, strict um, separation of each tenant for security reasons, um, 
but in our case, it was actually because we needed separate layer three stacks where um, the problem we were trying to solve is very VRF-ish. Uh, and there is a VRF talk uh, later on uh, in this conference, so I would, I'm actually pretty interested in seeing that. Um, but we, would, uh, we were trying to solve a problem where we had multiple um, tenants that had overlapping IP address spaces. So we needed multiple network stacks that were separated from one another and be able to have our core application uh, just not care about that. So I like pictures. And uh, you, you know that I drew this because it's very basic. Um, I like stick figure pic pictures because it's not from a marketing person. Um, but this is a very high level overview of uh, our uh, storage appliance architecture. Uh, this is very similar to something like Ceph, if you've seen this, but this is also uh, the SolidFire architecture. And uh, so here we have some kind of database. It's a distributed database within a clustered environment. Uh, we have a bunch of nodes in a cluster. Um, and this contains metadata for where volumes live on which nodes in the cluster. Right? So this is just a loose cluster of kind of commodity hardware with a bunch of SSDs rammed into them. And each one has volumes that hosts. Uh, we have some cluster management software. Um, we use Apache Zookeeper uh, for this. Um, and so we have this running on all the nodes as well. And then on each node, we have a thread pool. We have a generic set of threads that just do general purpose work, uh, whether it's network processing, whether it's RPCs, uh, intra cluster, or if it's actual database transactions that we need to be processing, um, and IO. Uh, and then we have a nice SCSI stack that we run in uh, user space currently. And then down into the kernel, uh, we're listening on well-known port 3260 on top of a network stack. So this is pre-network namespace. This is what we had. Um, and jumping to what we now have, uh, hopefully people can see that okay. Um, kind of walk through this a little bit. We have the same uh, business logic up here, the core logic, the volume database, the cluster management, the thread pool. Um, these remained unchanged. Um, some of the, the starting points that we had were how do we make these separate network stacks? Right, so each one of these is a network namespace. Uh, call it one, two, and three. Um, if you can envision the network namespaces, we, th we thought, well, maybe we can fork um, one of these processes off. So we can have two processes running on two uh, network namespaces, and that turned into be an IPC nightmare, right? Because all of a sudden now your core logic is affected um, by having to do some kind of IPC synchronization of the volume database, the cluster management, um, and for pretty complex applications that are trying to you know, enforce a Pax OS type uh, environment for your uh, database, that just wasn't something that was gonna work. Um, that would have too big of an impact on the, uh, the core architecture. Um, one of the other approaches that we had uh, was to actually spawn off a thread, uh, a new thread per namespace, um, as a dedicated worker thread for any I.O. coming through that network stack. And that looked great, it actually worked pretty well until we scaled past like 16 namespaces and then everything fell on its face. Um, you know, in one of these complex environments like a Ceph or a pure storage or a, or a solid fire, um, these thread pools are pretty massive, right? There's thousands of threads running at any given time on a, on a node doing any bit of work that we have. So having all these idle threads going up to hundreds of namespaces uh, was really a, a, a big impact and a waste on system uh, resources. So instead, uh, we decided to uh, go with this network namespace approach where we bound, uh, we created and then bound and listened on port 3260 in each namespace. And we kind of stumbled across this nice little thing where while the ports are separate, they're in separate uh, layer three domains, um, the file descriptors that back them are global to the host. And I was like, holy crap, that's awesome. So we can just shove all of these uh, file descriptors into an ePoll loop, and whenever something needed to happen on that file descriptor, we got a notification, said, oh, which namespace are you in? Switch to it, and then we can start processing socket data. Um, and I'll get into more details about that and, and how some of the, the logic behind that works. So that's the basic gist of how we got to the architecture that we're going after. And now I'd like to kind of go into um, how do we kind of make this work? So I don't like busy slides, and I apologize for this, but I th thought to just kind of cram it all into one, and then we'll walk through it bit by bit. 
Um, so for those of you that, that uh, use namespaces directly, um, this is probably something you've seen before, but if you haven't used network namespaces, then this is something that actually behaves differently than other namespaces like PID namespaces or mount namespaces, uh, where those are more programmatic um, through system call, um, direct system call uh, interaction to create them, uh, where network namespaces actually have uh, the ability to be created from the command line with the IP Route 2 uh, suite, so through Netlink. Uh, so we use uh, IP net NS add, and then you can give it a namespace name, and that does some magical plumbing in the kernel, and you have a net, uh, net namespace thing that shows up uh, on the file system, and I'll get to that here in a second. Um, incidentally, we were actually talking about this last night at the, uh, at the dinner about how this is actually potentially a security issue that needs to be addressed for uh, secure containers, so uh, that should be a pretty interesting discussion um, in the future. Uh, you can also use Netlink directly, so if you want to um, you know, use libnl or send raw Netlink commands yourself, you can do that as well. Um, or if you're creating a new thread or a process uh, using clone, you use the uh, clone new net flag and that will create the new namespace underneath. And then it will place the, the thread that you just created into that new namespace. Um, so let me back up a little bit. If you create the namespace with IP NetNS or Netlink, um, all that's doing is actually creating the namespace. It hasn't actually associated anything, uh, any thread or, or, or process context into that new namespace. So it's now just an empty container that is waiting for something to be put into it. Uh, and that, that's actually a pretty important thing to, uh, to, to uh, distinguish between the clone. Um, so programmatically, we, uh, we just use the command line, um, mostly because of, uh, of some GPL things with, uh, with LimNL that we're trying to sort out our, on our own for our application. Since it is a user space application that's currently closed sourced, uh, we have to watch what we link to. Um, our, our plan is to move towards a Netlink uh, approach, but this was a kind of a quick and dirty hack. Um, once you have actually created the namespace, and this is where we started doing the aha moments. Um, a lot of the documentation that you'll find out there says, well, all of your namespaces live in proc, PID, NS, you know, net, PID, um, mount, UTC. But that means that you have to actually have a process in the namespace to figure out which namespace it's in. And I found that pretty frustrating when I was trying to you know, sort through some of this architecture in, in the early stages of this because I'm like, I just created the namespace and I don't have anything in it, so how do I get to it if it's, if I, you know, it's a chicken and egg and horse cart problem or however you want to say it. Um, so we stumbled on that uh, run net NS or var run net NS on other distros um, also has uh, another kernel special file get created that happens to be the same uh, kernel inode of the namespace that's referred to in proc pid NS net for a pid that's in that namespace. So we, we had that aha moment that we now had a, a, a static handle that was a well-known handle that's on the file system that will be there in any network namespace uh, that we can go ahead and open um, using the open system call, get a file descriptor that we can then store long-term for the lifetime of the namespace within the application, and then we can use that with the set NS call to switch into the namespace when we need it to. Um, once you have a thread or a process that's in that namespace, then you can go through the proc PID uh, NS net. Um, and that becomes important here in a little bit for some of the more advanced uh, lifecycle management of how do you get threads back to where they came from. Okay. So the identification of a namespace is something that became also a challenge for us. Um, once you have the name, you know, run that NS namespace one, for example, um, you can open it, get a file descriptor, you know, some opaque handle that you hold on to for a while. Um, and the reason that we did the opaque handle that we held on to the lifetime of the namespace was because we don't know when that namespace might go away. And we also don't want to do some sort of synchronization between threads saying, okay, which one currently has this thing open? We didn't have, want to have like 500 references open to this namespace that we're trying to use it while some other context is trying to tear it down. So we said grab one file descriptor, store it off as metadata in the application, and then we'll use it later on whenever any thread needs to switch. But that presents a different challenge of 
how do you know that that's the namespace that, that you actually want to be in? Because by file descriptor and name, that may not be sufficient. If you destroy the namespace and then recreate a namespace of the same name, you can still get the same file descriptor integer back, um, but that will be a different handle to that namespace. So you can switch into it and all sorts of things just come flying off the rails. Um, we were scratching our heads as to why are we just seeing data that is definitely not from the socket that we think it is. Uh, and it turned out that we, we had this big, you know, really bad mismatch. So this is one of the areas that I want to get to in some of the proposed improvements, um, but not jumping ahead too far. Uh, one of the things for granularity that we came up with was we looked at the modification time, or the end time, uh, from stat on run net NS namespace name. So we have run net NS namespace one. You can call stat on that, you get the kernel inode, and you get all sorts of stuff. Uh, but the end time uh, happened to be uh, tracked as also the creation time. So this wasn't something that changed if you made any changes to the namespace through its lifetime. And the granularity of that uh, for the actual uh, time spec is, is pretty good. So if we're able to create and destroy and create namespaces at, you know, at nanosecond levels, uh, then we'd be screwed using this approach. Uh, so this got us granularity that was good enough for what we're trying to do uh, at, at this time. So once we figured that out, we said, let's go ahead and store the M time. Uh, we'll store the file descriptor of that, that long running opaque handle and the name uh, and store that in some metadata for each namespace alongside the file descriptor of that TCP port that we bound in that namespace. And now we know when we get an event on that, that TCP socket, get a file descriptor, we, we can look at the namespace metadata and we can know exactly which namespace we need to be in. So uh, this is pretty basic stuff, but I, you know, again, to level set, um, once we have all this, this opaque data, uh, that, that is the metadata to track the namespace, uh, switching between them um, is just done with the set NS system call. Uh, so a very, very basic example is to open a file descriptor, you know, run that NS namespace one, re open it read only, it doesn't really matter, you're not gonna be able to write to it, it's a read only file anyways. Um, and then you call set NS with the clone new net flag. Um, set NS can fail. Um, if you refer back to if you have a, a handle that was destroyed uh, to a namespace and you have this thing still around and you try to use that same file descriptor, uh, it will fail. Uh, we ran into some other races in 3.8 that we had to work around that seemed to be fixed in, in at least 4.2 was the last kernel we tested. Um, we, we haven't searched for which change set actually fixed one of these races of between creation of the namespace and being able to call set NS on it. Uh, so just be aware that there might be some, some demons lurking. Um, but the more interesting thing is if you have an application that you have all these threads uh, and some of these threads might be running IO in one context and then the next time they get scheduled they might be running control plane stuff. So non-data path, not hot path. Uh, so you may want to get them back to where they came from. Right, so you might switch into namespace one, but you may want them to be uh, back in this, what, what we call the default namespace, or we refer to internally as the base namespace, um, which is of the initial namespace when the, when the system's created. Uh, so the quick and dirty way is just open up uh, PID1's net namespace, uh, because that really should never change, unless you're using PID namespaces and you have multiple PID1's running around, and then you get to deal with the, the nested hell that you created on yourself. Um, but we can store this, uh, this base namespace file descriptor as well when we're setting all of this up and, you know, when the application starts to say if we need to get back to this base network namespace, uh, now we have a file handle um, that we know how to get back to it. So that's all, all well and good. Once we can identify the namespace, we know how to create them um, and we can switch between them. Uh, we started seeing some, some actual data moving through the system, and that was really, really encouraging. However, and uh, the, the ordering of the slides, the, the next one talks about some, some horrible scalability problems that we ran into um, with, within the kernel plumbing. I'll get to that in a second. Um, once we solved that, um, and now we're dealing with optimizations of using the set NS system call and using all this metadata that we've built up. Uh, we ran into some problems with scalability because for every single thread in our application, that, like I said, it might be running 
control plane stuff. It might be running database transactions. It might be running RPCs within nodes in the cluster, or it might be running I.O. We didn't know whenever any thread was going to be in that context. So we just said, screw it, we'll call setNS on everything. And it worked. It worked. I mean, I.O. ran, and that was fantastic. Um, but uh, we ran into a problem where the overhead for the context switch, even if we didn't have to switch in the namespace, was killing our performance. Um, and this is the data that, that I can't put in a slide because then it's published, but I can talk about it, and I guess it's on a video, but I can just deny it. Um, it seems to work for politics. Um, so what we did was we took that same uh, file descriptor, uh, metadata, and name at the end time, and put it into thread local storage for each thread in our system. So whenever the thread got scheduled and we had some ePoll event or we had an inline send or an inline receive that we're uh, waiting on, uh, we can look at the socket, we can pull out um, the, the, the metadata of the namespace that that socket needed to be in and then compare it with the thread local storage of where was this thread last. Look at them and say, holy crap, they match, don't call set NS. Um, so to give some context around uh, what the impact was, uh, on our systems, our, our base cluster, the one that most of my testing was done on, um, it's a 200,000 IOP, iSCSI uh, target. Uh, you know, just four machines, pretty basic, um, 4K block sizes. Um, prior to doing this efficient namespace switching, uh, we were running uh, at about anywhere from a 15 to 40% hit in uh, throughput. Um, at 100% CPU utilization. So it was a very noticeable hit in performance. And this was with uh, 512 network namespaces. Using this technique with the same exact setup with the same number of namespaces, we see about a 3% hit. So it's a very, very significant optimization, um, something that, that when I saw the numbers, I couldn't believe it. So we ran the test for about a week, and that's when I convinced myself that that actually worked. Uh, so we were pretty surprised and pretty happy about that. And so, yeah, I put that same picture up, and I was supposed to talk through that with the whole process, but I think we already covered that, so I'll move on. So this is the, the biggest thing that we ran into um, that we had to solve. And so the earlier versions of the uh, NS proxy handling and the task struct um, used to be uh, under RCU protection. And uh, there was a discussion on the mailing list uh, a couple years ago, again, old crusty kernel. Um, that discussed that there were some performance issues. Well, they didn't really characterize what the issues were or how, how severe they were. Um, and we saw as we added more network namespaces, obviously we're going to uh, incur more switching, uh, we started seeing massive latency spikes uh, in our I.O. And uh, Eric Biederman did fix this. I want to say it was in 3.17 or 3.19, roughly. Uh, so it's, it's you know, still pretty long ago in, in terms of uh, kernel, kernel age. Um, but we backported the, the, the fix. Um, this was to put it under a task struct, or a, um, a task lock, spin lock protection, um, to actually switch the, uh, the NS proxy structures uh, from one namespace to another um, for the task. And this is where we're very concerned um, that if People don't understand the, the massive amount of impact that this had. We wanted to bring it up, share it, and say, this is an area that we, we really, really want to keep an eye on and make sure that we don't break this again. Um, so looking at some, some graphs, let's try to highlight this. Um, so this graph, um, the, uh, the y-axis is latency of how long it took to switch. Uh, so basically, this is not the I.O., this is the amount of time that it took for the set NS to start and then for it to return for us to be able to continue processing. So uh, this is in microseconds on the y-axis and on the x-axis, this is um, uh, the number of network namespaces we were running. Uh, the orange-ish line is um, the old kernel under RC protection. Uh, the teal line is, or the green line, Jeff, uh, is under task lock protection. And so we see about five microseconds at one namespace. Um, at 16, um, task lock, we're still at five. Uh, we go up to about 12. And at 64, we jumped up to about 150 under the old kernel, um, but remained at uh, five for 64. 
Now, the reason I put this graph up is because it puts it into perspective when we go out to 512 namespaces, where there, there actually still is a data line on the x-axis that isn't the x-axis. Um, but out at 512 under task lock, it's still at around five microseconds. Um, and we shot up to about 550 milliseconds or half a second um, per switch. So you can imagine we're trying to run at 200,000 IOPS and all of a sudden I'm seeing IOPS at like 100 IOPS because of the amount of latency in between each IO where we're waiting for the kernel to switch. Um, so this was a, a, a very, very simple fix that had a very, very massive impact and um, that there might have been a lot of sleep and gray hair um, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. So this leads me to um, kind of the wrap up and proposed improvements. Now these are uh, two things that we could come up with uh, throughout the course of working around a lot of the, uh, the issues that we ran into. These are very, very loose suggestions and these are more things that I'd like to have you know, a broader discussion about. Um, these are definitely not things like I'm saying we, you know, we must do this, but um, we definitely want to try to add some more or any uh, given yesterday's discussion about the um, lack of testing of anything in the kernel uh, networking area right now. We'd like to add some kind of torture tests, unit tests, uh, maybe along the lines of RCU uh, torture tests um, that could help us detect uh, performance regressions um, in network namespace switching. So that's one area that, that we would really like to focus on and um, you know, my, my team back at SolidFire is, is ready to uh, try to address. Um, that's one thing, but the, the bigger uh, issue that we see is um, we were running into this uniqueness problem. So I spend a little bit of time talking about we had the file descriptor, then we had the name, and then we stumbled on the M time, uh, which was kind of a, a good workaround to help identify um, one of these namespaces. And um, within a clustered environment like ours where you, know, you have clocks on each machine and you know, we, we, we can't really rely on the fact that uh, you know, time skews don't happen, um, they do. And uh, we did actually run into some kind of Heisenberg bugs, very, very, very difficult to reproduce, but um, some of these torture tests that our, our test engineers had uh, create namespaces, destroy them, create them, destroy them, and all of a sudden we fail to set it, um, actually switch into a namespace, and we have I.O. failures. And we traced it to, we had a clock skew that was just enough to show that the M time was the same on a new namespace that was just created. And so we had a bad handle. Right up here in the front, please. talking about the end time of the file descriptors in the proc file system? Or this is the, the, uh, the end time of the file of, of the uh, network namespace file descriptor that we pulled from stat of proc NS. Exactly. Proc so, NS. so they can get re they can like get renewed every time basically you I think you can't really like think that they are stable. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying is that yeah, uh, so yeah. I, I think it's conceptually just like if you do an echo three to um, drop caches. Also, I think that actually the proc of S will rebuild those I nodes and you will see new, new M times. No, so the M time of, the, of, of a namespace that exists um, actually doesn't change over time is what we found. Okay. But if we, if we destroyed the namespace and created a new one, but the clock skewed, the M time actually could have lined up to be the one that the previous one was. Okay, I'm surprised by that, but... Okay, uh, we were, we were very you. surprised as well. Okay, thanks. PJ, did you try um, using the uh, file system notify stuff Yes, we, we use iNotify to figure out when a namespace. Okay. We, we have a very asynchronous way of actually creation right. uh, of the namespaces and then actually starting up the IO path. And the problem is that the iNotifies can stack up. Right. And so we process one and then we might have four in the queue behind it and that's actually what happened here. Um, by the time we tried to switch into a namespace of the new one that was there, we hadn't processed the new iNotify yet. <laughs> okay. So my first reaction when I looked at your context switching issue, I'm like, yo, why isn't set NS doing this optimization? Why isn't it saying, oh, the, the net namespace point is the same return immediately? Um, it's, it's actually because, well, we would have to do that up in the uh, C library. We wouldn't 
want to take the actual context switch to get into the system call itself. I'm just saying it should have been pretty freaking fast if the namespace is equivalent. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> But that, that, that could be an area that we look at and try I to I think so, because I mean, I really don't think that uh, applications should be, have to be aware of this issue. If the, if this is very, they should be able to execute a very simple model of set NS for the operation I'm about to execute, and that should be reasonably fast if there's no switch involved. No, that's, that, yeah, that's great input, and, and that's something that we can certainly look at. Also, another issue that's come up a lot is uh, the size of all the stuff that gets attached to a new net namespace when you create it. Is this an issue in your realm at the scale that you're making namespaces? Um, that's a very good question. Um, the, the, the simple answer is no. Okay. Um, the, the, the machines that we actually run are running anywhere from 384 gigs of RAM to a lot more than that. Okay. It used to be ridiculous. We used to hang hundreds of hundreds of kilobytes worth, and if not megabytes worth of hash tables and whatever. And what's happened over time is there's been a consolidation to the point where we're like, okay, so this is a hash table we'll just add a namespace cookie to the key for lookups instead of having a uh, hash table per namespace. And so that's the kind of things that are happening in that area. Uh, and how important is NetSpace creation and destroy performance for you? Um, depends on who you ask. Okay. Um, we, are, we are good with how it works in 3.8 right now. Okay. Um, so our our concern is how well we fail over in our cluster from one, one machine to another if we have a machine die or something happens. And then you have to bring up like And then we have to bring up like hundreds of namespaces for new, new iSCSI targets. So and as long as we're within a certain time bound, we're okay. And right now we're within the sign. I think eventually it will be important. Okay, good. I just want to warn you that um, I recently got bugs that we have like worse namespace creation and deletion times with newer kernels than with old kernels. See, it's good to be uh, running on crusty old kernel sometimes. Yeah. Uh, oh, that, that's good. So just a comment about the, some of the scalability issues and architectural design issues. That's why myself and then my company Cumulus has been saying that a namespace is a very heavyweight solution for a VRF. And that's why we have the VRF implementation that was accepted into the, the 4.3 and forward kernels. It's specifically for some of these design problems that, that you're experiencing. Yeah, when I when I saw that uh, you, you're you're giving the talk yeah. later, okay. so I'm I'm very interested to see that talk because we don't have that infrastructure available in the kernels that we have right now, um, and so this is something where if we got something like this, at least the plumbing in place in the application, right, we can move it to something a little bit more uh, general purpose um, in in newer kernels. So that's I'm very interested to see what what what's going on there. Um, so anyway, so the uniqueness uh, issue is something that I think we still need to solve. Um, I just threw out kind of a UUID-like mechanism that we might expose through PROC or, or, or something. Um, it, it's definitely something that bit us, uh, and I think it's something that's, that's worth solving. Um, and so I've, I'm hoping to bring this to the, uh, to the list and just get some discussion around it, get some uh, ideas, maybe some hallway conversations here to just brainstorm and see if uh, people have some, some thoughts on this. Why don't you use Ripley and parse? Mike. Um, what is the reason you don't use read link and pass the inode out of the bracket thing? Uh, because right now we're not tracking the inodes. Um, and we were actually seeing where they, uh, I, I, actually I want to take that back. I, I don't remember if we were seeing the same inode show up. I'm pretty sure that you do it because like we use this NS install which, which, mm -hmm. which uses a global inode allocator and, and it okay. creates a unique inode and it's atomic and it should be like visible all over all the places. So, so that, that may, that should that actually may be, be a, a, be a, a really good That's way. a unique idea and I actually use it also for, for things and it worked out so far for okay. me. So out of curiosity, would you, would you think it's a good idea to they hack for var get net, var net ns if the kernel magically, uh, by choice, you, you have to say you want this feature, magically out of bind mount the na a name of some phone or a, like you say a UID. So you don't have to go and scan prop PID or it's just there and you get I notify to say a namespace has been created. What, what do you think of that idea? I think that'd be fantastic. I mean, that, that, that's a, a nice common way for anyone to go just subscribe to the yeah. I notify and then boom, you get that's the right. notification. And that would solve uh, one of the race problems that we saw of when the namespace was created that we can get that I notify when the kernel was actually done creating the namespace and getting all the plumbing in place. 
and then we would know that we can actually start switching into it. There's actually a, uh, there's actually a PID that gets, but it's an opaque piece of data that put, gets put in the NetNS. You can actually set it yourself from the user space. Mm -hmm. IP Route 2 seems to have support for it. Uh, uh, somebody seems to be using that, but it's an opaque piece of data, and, yes. and anybody can overwrite it. But it would be nice if you could get like notification when namespaces get created, I think. So, so we actually do the uh, I notify on the run NetNS directory, right. uh, like Stephen was saying. We ran into the problem that we were actually getting namespace file handles showing up in run NetNS before they were ready, uh, which was a very interesting problem. And we, we don't seem to see that in newer kernels, so we don't know where it, we haven't spent the time to figure out where it changed. Okay. Uh, but. Um, I'm here for the rest of the time. Um, I'm at my 35 minutes, so I don't want to cut into someone else's time. Uh, please feel free to grab me, um, ask me questions, have discussions, um, threaten me on stuff that we did. Um, but uh, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.